Back in 1999, the Chinese um, government invited me to bring 300 Christians to share Christ in the nation. Actually, that's not exactly what happened. But they did invite me to bring artists, and I brought 300 artists from 20 countries into China to do a cultural exchange, which the Chinese government said was the largest in the history of that nation. And we performed and developed relationship alongside 400 Chinese artists. One of the things that I had wanted to do since going to China in the early 80s was to actually do a performance, a full performance of Handel's Messiah in China. And this was the opportunity. Although we didn't go in and do overt Christian things, this was one of the more overt things that we did, and it was an extraordinary experience. I took the words of Messiah right out of scripture and had them translated into Chinese and put into the computer so that during the performance they could be scrolled down the side of the stage. I found the best orchestra I could find in the south of China. And I had artists, soloists from Europe, North America and China and a recorded choir. And together on the 10th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square incident, we performed Handel's Messiah performed by an orchestra that had never played it before, to an audience that had never heard it before. And at the end of the performance, it was obvious that people were profoundly moved. The next day, the newspaper that went out to 40 million people headlined, Messiah Touches Hearts. And the newspaper editorial said, if you were there and you were moved by this performance, please write in your story and we will publish it. And people wrote in how they were moved and they published their stories. The power of the arts to transcend politics, culture, religion, language, to act as a bridge, a bridge of hope, a bridge of relationship into the nations. I was traveling to Korea a while back, and uh, next to me was a Korean man. And he said, what are you doing in Korea? And I said, I'm teaching. He said, what are you teaching on? I said, I'm teaching on the arts and the Christian story. And he said, are you a Christian? And I said, yes. He said, well, so am I. He said, I've got a question for you. What on earth have the arts got to do with the Christian story? Wrong question. It was a 15-hour flight and he had nowhere to go. <laughs> there have, of course, been times, particularly here in Europe, when, when faith, when the Christian story and the arts have come together in profound ways that have influenced Europe. But over the course of Christian history, there has been an uneasy relationship between the church and the arts. When we use that word art, Sometimes people switch off. Maybe when you saw this was coming up tonight, you thought this might be a good idea to catch up on some of your email. You know, when we hear a word like art, there's a lot of baggage that we bring to it. And we say, maybe this is not for me. I, I, I don't have any interest in the arts at all. Well, let me suggest to you that the arts are rooted in the imagination. And every one of us, the, uh, the imagination is critical for us. This whole conference has been about hope. You cannot have hope without the imagination because you would forever be, we would forever be locked into the present. We would not be able to write our mission statements because all we would know is what we experience right now. We would not have the ability to imagine how life could be different. And I believe we need here in Europe, in the churches, to bring a recovery and understanding a theology, if you will, of the arts and the imagination. Scripture introduces us to a group of artists. These artists are very despondent. They're discouraged. They're struggling with their identity. In fact, they're so discouraged that they have given up their craft. And these artists we find in Psalm 137, and they're weeping by the rivers of Babylon. They're part of God's people in exile. 
and they're longing to go home, longing to, to go to where they belong. And they're struggling, and they've abandoned their instruments. They've laid them up in the willow trees. And I believe today that is a picture of so much of the church, and certainly the church here in Europe, where we have not understood the arts and the imagination. In fact, the church has been in exile to those things for so long. And one of the casualties, of course, has been those who have been gifted and called in special ways to be artists. And they've struggled in the church, struggled with their identity, struggled to understand how they could take that God-given gift and use it for his glory. And many of them have abandoned the church because they found no place where they could take and celebrate that gift. Others stayed in the church, and but they gave up the very gifts and calling that God has placed upon their lives. And as I travel in Europe, I find gifted believers, artists, called and gifted by God who today are in great pain and are struggling and are wounded. And it's not always the church's fault. We understand that, because artists can be very difficult people. But I believe this is a picture of what is happening and has been happening for a very long time, a situation of exile. But we know in the scriptures the prophets began to speak that a time was coming when God would take his people out of exile and take them back home to Jerusalem to where they belonged. And the word of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 62 says, move through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build a highway, remove the stones. And God was saying to his people, I'm taking you out of exile, I'm taking you home to where you belong. But I want you to prepare the way for those who are going to come. I want you to take those stones that have been stumbling blocks and will be stumbling blocks and remove them. And I believe today we are living in a time of homecoming as it relates to the church and the arts. Would I like to see us further along the road? Absolutely. But when I look back in England where I was 40, 50 years ago, and I see where we've come today, there's been tremendous progress, but we have a long, long way to go. But the move has begun. And Christians all over the world, all over Europe, are saying in a new way, with a new intensity, God has gifted me. I'm going to take that gift. And I'm going to go to develop it, and I'm going to use it for his glory, whether it's in the church or whether it's on the mission field or whether it's right in the center of our cultural marketplace or whether it's in the academy. Christians in unprecedented numbers are going to take that gift and are developing it for the glory of God. But there are stones still that need to be removed. There are stones in the church that have caused this lack of understanding of art as a gift from God to be celebrated for his glory. There are certainly stones in the life of the artists that have caused them to stumble and to fall as they have sought to exercise their gift. And there are stones in our culture that if we're not aware of, that they will too cause the artist to stumble. And sadly, sad to say, I know a number of artists who love God and were very gifted and who wanted to go out into the center of the culture to be salt and light and today no longer mention the name of Christ. But on the return home, there was a vision, there was a task to fulfill. And Isaiah 61.4 makes it very clear that the returning exiles were to rebuild and renew and restore the ancient ruins that have been devastated for many generations. And I believe today there is a homecoming. But I believe God wants to see the artists come back to be restored, restored back into who God created them to be, restored back to the church so that they could be part of what God is building, his kingdom. But it wasn't just rebuilding the temple when the exiles went back. They had to rebuild the walls, and that speaks to me of the societal structures. And the more I meet with artists, even non-Christian artists, there is a passion today for the arts to address and speak to social justice issues. And I believe God is calling the artists and speaking to the Christian artist of his heart of the brokenness of our world. But before I believe that we can fully enter into as artists all that God has prepared for us, 
that there needs to be a restoration of relationship. There's so much broken relationship between spiritual leadership in the church and the artist. And I believe it's on God's heart to see them come together and to be mutu- there to be mutual repentance and forgiveness that the arts might be restored back to the church in a vibrant and powerful way and be a part of God's purposes today. We all know the Great Commission to disciple the nations. I believe one of the greatest disciplers of the nations today is the arts and entertainment industry. They're literally discipling young people around the globe as the arts more and more shape culture. In 1991, just after the fall of communism, I was in St. Petersburg, Russia, at the invitation of the government. And they said, we are in a place where we need hope and encouragement. Would you bring, and they specifically said, would you bring Christian artists to our country to encourage us, to give us hope? And at that time, they told me that they had a building in the middle of St. Petersburg, a palace that had been the headquarters of the Communist Party for 70 years. And they said, that building has a terrible reputation. We need to rehabilitate it. Would you help us to do that? Would you take this palace? Well, being English, no one had ever offered me a palace before, so I was, I was pretty excited. And we went down the Nevsky, and there they broke the seal off of the building which they'd put on when they kicked the communists out. They took me in to the office of the leader of the Communist Party, which was sealed. They broke the seal. I sat down and saw the picture of Lenin behind me. But at that point, at that historic moment, I believe God spoke to my heart in one of those life-defining moments, that he wanted to open the doors of nations that were close to his truth, and that he was going to do it through the arts and through the imagination. This should come as no surprise that God is interested in the arts. When we look at how God communicated his story to us, it's been suggested that 75% of scripture is narrative and story that appeals to the imagination and invites us in to participate. 15% of scripture is poetry. And so 90% of the way God communicated his story to us appealed to the imagination. Only 10% of scripture is didactic, instructional, and propositional. And what have we done today as the church? We have reversed that. And so in the retelling of that story, 90% of what we do is didactic, instructional, propositional. Only about 10% appeals to the imagination. And if we look in Scripture, we see the arts there were part of celebration. They were part of worship. The arts were part of warfare. They were used to bring revelation and understanding. They express truth and beauty. And even God himself is introduced to us as the original artist. And we're made in his image with the ability to be creative people and to appreciate beauty. He even placed the man and the woman in the garden and he gave them trees that were not only functional, good for food, but also beautiful to look at because that's who God has made us to be. There is an aesthetic dimension of our life. And when God's people were in the desert grumbling about the manna burgers, God commissioned a work of art, a sculpture, through which he spoke to his people and brought new hope and healing to them. Was it the art itself that brought that restoration? No, but it was a window through which the people looked and saw God in a fresh and a new way. When God was giving Moses the Ten Commandments at the same time, he commissioned the first school of the arts and chose its director, Basilel, to make artistic designs in the tabernacle. We look at the street theater and performance art of the prophets, the celebrative dance, the music therapy, the pervasion of music in scripture, and Jesus himself, this great storyteller who always appealed to the imagination of his hearers. We are living today, I believe, in a cultural shift. Two writers have used a a car analogy 
in describing this. McLaren, talking about modernity, said this, narrative, poetry, and the arts in general took a back seat or else they were asked to leave the car entirely to hitchhike on their own. Or they were brought along for their entertainment value, but generally not as serious front seat colleagues in the church in the search for truth. This was modernity. And today, very often in the church, the artists are taken out of their box and dusted off at Easter and Christmas and then put back in the box for the rest of the year. We've not understood the changes that are happening in our world, nor have we developed an understanding biblically of the place of the arts and the imagination. But Daniel Pink goes on to say this, taking the analogy of the car, talking about post-modernity, he says this, the future belongs to a very different kind of person with a very different kind of mind. Creators, artists, designers, storytellers, Right brain thinking is suddenly grabbing the wheel, stepping on the gas, and determining where we are going and how we get there. And I'm sure for many of you here today, that's a very scary thought. But we need a paradigm shift as believers. N.T. Wright says this about the arts. The arts are not the pretty but irrelevant bits around the border of reality. They are highways into the center of a reality which cannot be glimpsed, let alone grasped, any other way. The arts are essential for life, and they are essential for faith. And I believe like the Lord called Lazarus out of that dark place of death, he's calling the church today out of that place of death as it relates to the arts and the imagination. He's calling artists out of their wounds and their pain, and he's calling them back to a place of life. But you know, what I find very often amongst artists, and it's not just artists, I find it with Christian workers in many parts of the world, we're jaded with cynicism. And you see, cynicism is the enemy of hope. It says, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, didn't work, therefore I, I do not want to believe anymore or hope anymore. And many artists are in that place, but thankfully they're coming out of that place and they're coming to a place of healing and I believe are going to be used by God very powerfully in these days as they come back into the church, the mission field, the marketplace, and the academy. I heard a story the other day about a group of artists who went to a Muslim country and before they went, they just prayed and said, Lord, speak to us about what we should do. And they felt like the Lord gave them the scripture about he being the door. And so that's what they did. They went into this Muslim nation and they spent the time there looking around, finding doors and painting doors. And there was a young girl, an artist there, and she was having such a hard time with this. And as she prayed about it, she felt like the Lord said, I want you to paint a lock. And so she found this huge, like medieval type door with a huge lock and she painted it. And through the lock, she painted a door in the distance that was slightly ajar and there was light coming out of the door. And the time came when they finished, they went down into the marketplace and they put their artwork there and exhibited their artwork. And as she was looking, she saw this old man standing in front of her painting. And he was looking at it and engaging it and staring at it. And as she watched, she saw the tears rolling down his face. And she grabbed a translator and went over and said, Sir, I, I see that you're moved by my painting. Can you tell me what is it that you're seeing? And he said, this is my life. He said, all my life I have searched for the light. But there has been this huge door that has prevented me entering into it. And there was a lock that I could not open. And if you are the artist who painted this picture, you have the answer. Will you tell me, how do I open the door and move into the light that I have searched for all my life? Right there in the marketplace was a profound dialogue about Christ, the door. We don't have to have Christian iconography in our art. We don't have to have fishes and crosses 
to make it something that we as Christians can do. As Christians who are artists, we need to be working with excellence in our art, listening to God, listening to our materials, and presenting them to a world and allow God to speak and bring hope and healing. I believe that the arts today are powerful signposts, can be powerful signposts of hope to a world that has lost hope. A couple of years ago, a number of organizations, arts organizations here in Europe, came together to sponsor a summit. And 65 leaders in the arts across Europe came together from 15 European countries to listen to God, to listen to each other, to look at the arts and what was happening in Europe. And out of that has developed an organization here in Europe called Arts Plus Europe. And we're looking at and listening to what it is the Lord is saying, but we want to be in the nations an encouragement to artists to be able to pray for them, encourage them, help them to be who God has created them to be. We're looking at a European Arts Institute and what that might mean in Europe. But we're emphasizing networking, partnership, and shared resources. For too long, the body of Christ has worked in, in isolation. Artists have worked in isolation. And I believe God is calling us together in those networks to develop partnerships and to share the resources that God has given us to be more effective in the gifts and callings that God has called us into. I want to finish by giving you just six very short envisioning statements about what we as Arts Plus Europe are believing for. Some of these things will take more than one generation. A number of them will. But we're going to begin and we're seeing some of these things happen. Let me read them to you. We imagine and we hope for a future in which the church in Europe will integrate into its theological foundations a response to God's gifts of beauty and creativity. We imagine and we hope for a future in which Christians in Europe are at the forefront of artistic innovation that will be celebrated in the corporate life of the church and its individual members, in the local cultural marketplace, and in the global entertainment industry. We imagine and hope for a future in which the church, in all people groups, will reinforce the biblical narrative, pass it on to the next generation, and celebrate the goodness of God within their own cultural framework, with their own indigenous instruments and art forms. We imagine and hope for a future in which artists will desire to be excellent in their craft, spiritually mature in their walk, humble in their attitude, servant-hearted in motivation, moral in lifestyle, and uncompromising in their obedience to Christ. We envisage and hope for a future in which art patronage is once again seen as a responsibility of the church, enabling great works of art to be produced that will affirm our story, celebrate our common humanity, challenge our thinking, enrich our world, and bring glory to God. And finally, we imagine and hope for a future in which Christians in every diverse cultural context of our world will exhibit a lifestyle of creativity and beauty, pointing to the day in which the original artist will make all things new. We're going to close this segment with showing you a short video 
about the Crescendo Summer Arts Institute that grew out of Hope 21. And I hope this will encourage you and inspire you. Thank you. My name is Beat Rink. I am leading Crescendo International, this movement which is organizing the Summer Institute of the Arts in Hungary. This is a movement among classical and jazz musicians, professionals and students. Our goals are networking around the world. Today, 2,000 musicians involved in this movement. And we would like to help other arts groups, painters, actors, dancers, to start with similar ministries. In a very traditional way, we were making drawings and studying, but we are working here very independently from the other activities wonderful opportunity to look for the newest tendencies and uh, what's going on in the, in the world of art. I think there are two reasons why someone should consider coming to the Crescendo Summer Institute of the Arts. The first involves what we see behind us. Uh, rehearsal taking place where people are working towards excellence, opportunity to study with um, some of the greatest teachers in the world. We are constantly amazed at the quality of the teachers that this institute attracts. On the other side, the reason to come is for those who really want something more than just art. People who want to find faith in art, to come to a place where we are worshiping, where Christians are gathered together in one place. Last summer was the first time I came here and I had heard many really good things about this institute from many different friends. I have met people who share both my faith and my musical interests. Relationships that are going to endure forever and it's very powerful because um, it's an international family. It's a great gift when you can work with people who are over your level. I really enjoyed uh, to talk to some people and get some new ideas. Thank you.